Hi, this is Ben, and welcome to SEO from Scratch. This is the introductory video where I'm going to show you the process, give you an idea of the process that we're going to follow. The goal of this video series is to give you everything you need to know to be able to promote any website to get more traffic from search engines. I'm going to give you the exact process that I use, I'll take you through it, and I'm even going to give you some tools that will help you to do that for free. So let's start. First of all, we need to ask why SEO? Why do we do SEO and what is it? Well, SEO is actually something that I think is quite difficult to define because it covers a lot of areas. Fundamentally, I think that SEO is just one aspect of marketing. Marketing is about creating products and finding people to buy those products. And SEO is about doing that. It also has a lot to do with design, the creation of the user experience, the creation of a channel that is going to deliver a desired result. And SEO has also got a lot to do with PR, with promotion because it's about finding the most efficient ways to get as many of the right kind of people to see your content as possible and when they come also to take action so SEO really handshakes with all areas I think of marketing online but the core of SEO is really fundamentally about traffic and I would describe it in this way SEO is purposefully getting more of the right traffic for your effort so for the minimum effort, how much of the right traffic can we get? But of course, traffic without conversion, without people taking action, is actually worthless. So it has to be the right traffic. Now, the action that you want people to take could be quite varied. It could be that you want them to buy from you or request a sales call or get in touch with you to generate a lead. It could be to sign up for your mailing list or it simply could be to click on ads or your goal may be simply to spread a message. For example, if you're a charity or a political organization, your goal simply could be to get your message to as many people as possible. So all of those are valid goals. And SEO needs to be done in the context of getting as many of those goals achieved as possible. So I'm going to give you my complete process, the exact process I use to get my clients more traffic. Now you don't need any SEO experience in order to follow this. I will explain everything from first principles from scratch. But when you've watched this series, you will actually have enough knowledge, I think, to be able to sell your services in SEO. The information that I'm going to give you is real practical stuff from first principles. You will understand what you need to do and you'll understand why we're doing it. So let's look at the process that we're going to be studying over this video series. We'll start with keyword research. That's identifying which search terms you want to rank for. Then we'll look at creating and optimizing content, deciding what content you need to create and how to make it relevant to the search term that you've chosen. Then we'll look at promotion because people have got to see your content. There's no point in having great content if it's not seen. So promotion is absolutely a great big part of SEO. And you will want to repeat the process. You'll need to track the content that you have out there. You may need to respond to changes in ranking. And of course, you can always go back to your keyword research, create more content to get more traffic. And that's how it works. So a quick overview of keyword research then. The purpose of keyword research is to identify target search phrases. And the types of phrases that we're looking for are phrases that have relatively high traffic, relatively low competition, and that are relevant to your offering. The next step is to create and optimize content. So as we said, we need to choose what content to create, choose where to publish that content because you do have options. And then we need to optimize your content around your target phrase. The next step after publishing your content is to promote it. Great content can't be popular unless it's seen. There's no point hiding your light under a bushel. And there are lots of ways that we can promote content. Link building is one. Social media is becoming more and more prominent over time. 
and also outreach so we'll cover all of those aspects and help you to decide for your content which is going to be the most effective for you at each time and finally repeat don't stop creating good content there's no limit to how much content you can create you will need to track your search positions regularly but not too regularly and you'll need to respond to changes that may happen if you gain positions for some reason if you drop in the search rankings for some reason that can have an impact on your traffic and I'm going to help you to discern which changes in ranking are the most important and which you need to respond to so all of this remember is about how to use your time most effectively because your time is the finite resource here and of course you don't want to stop promoting the content that you have and we'll look at ways that you can do that the more content that you have in theory the more people that you can reach and remember publishing online is cheap there really is no limit to how many pages that you can make publishing on the web is not like publishing a book or a magazine or bringing out a billboard ad advertisement or placing an ad in a, a newspaper for example I can create a web page in minutes and the tools that we have today platforms like WordPress make that so much easier and quicker to do but still I'm gonna keep emphasizing the importance of the quality of your content so I just want to say a little bit about the difference between black hat and white hat SEO these are terms that you may come across so let's just quickly describe what they are black hat SEO really refers to the discipline of getting web pages to rank as high as possible in the search engines whether or not that is done in a way that is really compatible with what the search engines really want Black Hat is about getting your content to rank using whatever means possible. White Hat SEO, on the other hand, means getting your content to rank as high as possible in a way that is completely in alignment with what the search engines want. Because what the search engines really want is genuine, high quality, relevant content that they can promote in response to people's searches. So White Hat if you want to boil it right down is about getting those rankings by creating that high quality relevant content whereas black hat you might describe as getting content to rank in a way that it appears more relevant than it actually is now the whole process that I'm going to describe to you is white hat SEO and let me explain why I'm proposing that this is the best method to follow well with white hat SEO the assets that you create the websites and the web pages that you create should actually gain value over time they should gain authority they should gain more links from other websites in a very natural way so there really should be no risk or less risk than using black hat techniques because if your content is genuinely good and genuinely useful and genuinely relevant then there is no reason why Google and other search engines shouldn't like your content and shouldn't actually be working with you to get more people to see that content if you use black hat techniques and I'm not going to talk about black hat techniques really in this series but there are a number of techniques that are designed to fool the search engines to think that content is more relevant than it actually is but you have to remember that Google's job is to be the best search engine it can be so there are teams of people working at Google whose mission it is to make that search engine do a better job at discerning what is really genuine relevant content from what is pretending to be genuine relevant content and when they find techniques that people are using that are trying to spoof the search engine that are trying to trick it they can take action against those techniques and this is happening all the time you know there are networks of websites that can be literally de-indexed from the search engines which means that those sites just will stop appearing in any search results at all so it's a very short-term strategy I would say and people who engage in that strategy have to be prepared for waking up one day and suddenly finding that their websites have disappeared off the search engines and so is their traffic so for me white hat approach is a much lower stress 
way to go about your business. And I like to think of it that you're working with G. Imagine that you want to make a big snowball and you're on a hill and you make a small snowball with your hands. What is the easiest way to make that snowball bigger? Well, it's going to be to roll it down the hill, right? When you roll your snowball down the hill, as it rolls, it will get bigger, it will gain more energy, and the bigger it gets, the more snow it gets, and the whole thing literally snowballs. And that's because you're working with gravity, you're working with G. And SEO is very similar, in my view. If you want to make your content gain traffic, gain attention, then work with G, work with Google. Create good content, first of all, and promote that content in a way that Google actually approves of. And I've done this and I will show you how great content literally snowballs. And you don't really have to do too much more work. If you create great content and you promote it enough so that people can see it, it gets out into the world, then it'll get people looking at it. And if it's good, then good content actually attracts more links which means that more people click lo those links and come to see it. And the more links it gets, the higher it's going to rank in the search engine results. And the higher it ranks in the search engine results, the more people come and see it and you get the snowball effect. Working against Google is like pushing your snowball up the hill. It's possible. You can roll a snowball up a hill, but you have to do the work. You're working against gravity. You're working against Google. So anytime you stop pushing, your traffic stops growing. So I know which way I prefer to work. And White Hat SEO is more automatic. You create good content and the system is designed to promote that content. You're working with natural law in a sense. So you can get more links while you sleep. And it also feels good. I don't enjoy the idea of trying to trick Google. I much prefer getting good results from Google and getting good feedback from the people who visit my websites and view my content and my clients content and to know that I'm doing that in a way that is not going to jeopardize my own business or my clients business and I can have pride in the work that I do. So let's make a start. Let's go over the basics of search engine optimization. So we have to start by looking at what the search engines are trying to do. Well a search engine's job is to identify the most relevant content. When somebody types in a search phrase, what's going to come number one? What's going to come up number two? See, search engines like Google usually have to arrange millions of potentially relevant pages in order of relevance. Imagine how difficult a task that is. Somebody types in dog breeders in a particular area, then Google has to go away and look at its enormous index of all the pages it has found on the web that may be to do with dog breeders in that area. And then it has to work out, well, which page is the most relevant to dog breeders in the area? So how do you decide what's relevant? Well, in the old days, in the mid-1990s, when I started making web pages, it was actually very easy to fool the search engines we had search engines like Hotbot and Lycos and AltaVista and they all really suffered from the same kind of limitation. Generally they looked only at on-page factors. They read the page and they said well what does this page say it's about? So you might have a thousand pages about dog breeders and then when the search engine reads the content of those pages just by looking at what the page says it's about it's quite difficult to say, well, which is the most relevant, which is the best, which is the most respectable, most authoritative page. So back in the 90s, it was actually possible to stuff your keywords into the page content, into the title, into meta tags, which are tags that can go into web pages that are not seen on the page, but which describe for the purposes of search engines and others what the page may be about. So you literally got people spamming their pages. You got them stuffing the same keyword, dog breeders, dog breeders, dog breeders, dog breeders, over and over again. And they found that when they did that, they got higher up in the search engines. Now the history 
of search on the web is like a couple of kids playing leapfrog. Somebody would find a way to spoof the search engines to trick them. And then the search engines would spot that technique and then they would overtake. And then the, you know, the black hat people would then find another technique. And it's, everyone's constantly playing catch up with each other. Now, the big change that happened in the late 1990s, about 1997, when Google came out, is that they took a very different approach to working out which page was the most relevant. So previously, as we know, spamming web pages actually worked. But then Google introduced something new. It introduced third-party signals. And the way it did that was to look at links. So for each page that may be relevant to dog breeders, they looked at, well, how many other pages link to that page? How many different websites link to that page? And the more links from different websites a page has pointing to it, the more authoritative we could say that page could be. And Google introduced, created something called page rank. So pages with more links from other pages would have a higher page rank, and then links from those pages pointing to other pages would then pass on more authority. So Google's system was designed to map out the authority of all the pages on the web. And it worked brilliantly. The spamming w was kind of cut out. And Google's search product very quickly turned out to be far more effective at doing what people actually want, which is to find the most relevant, the best, the most useful, the most respectable content on the web. And that is still Google's job. As we go into the future, links are still relevant, but I think that things like social signals will become actually more important over time. Because now, of course, what's been happening for the last 10 years or so is that SEO professionals, as we might call them, are now trying to spoof the link profiles of pages. So instead of spamming pages full of the same keyword over and over again, what they're trying to do is to find ways of artificially creating links from other pages, from other sites that point to the pages they want to promote, that make them appear to be more authoritative when, in fact, they aren't that authoritative. So now Google has to take a step back and look at what other signals it's got at its disposal. What other signs or fingerprints are there that we could use to tell which pages are actually the, the most relevant. So right now, we've got things like how many times is content tweeted? Who likes it on Facebook? Who shares it on Facebook? Is it added to social bookmarking sites? Is it promoted with the Google plus one button, which is pretty new? So all of those signals are going to become more important. So Google's job or a search engine's job is to judge relevance. It's got to establish from all the pages that it's got which is the most relevant. And there are really two ways, two main ways that it does this. One is still what the page says it's about. If your page has the title dog breeders and the term dog breeders is mentioned on the page, then that does mean something. That means that this page should actually feature somewhere in that mass of pages that could be to do with dog breeders. Okay. But those factors, those what we call on-page factors, only contribute a minority of the relevance of a page. Google's big innovation, remember, was what the rest of the world says the page is about. So they use those third-party links as votes for a particular page. And we call these off-page factors. So just to recap, the number of links and the number of websites that link to a page and the authority of those websites are taken into account. And also, we need to consider what the links say. So I'm going to show you a free tool now that will help you to know what the rest of the world says about you or about your content. So this is opensiteexplorer.org. It's a tool which you can use for free, and it's provided by the great guys at SEO Moz. So I'm just going to pick a page at random. I'll go on to my website and I'll find, I'll just take this page, it's one of my more popular pages. 
OK, and I'm going to paste that into the search box in Open Science Explorer. Now what this is going to do is it's going to go away and it's going to look on the SEO Moz's Linkscape database and it's going to tell me a number of factors about this page. It's giving me something called page authority which we'll go into in a lot more detail in later videos and domain authority and it's telling me that there are 21 linking root domains which means that there are 21 different websites that have links pointing to that particular page and on those 21 websites there are 70 links in total here on the inbound links it's telling me the five most authoritative pages with the highest page authority that are pointing to that page and here if I click on linking domains it's telling me the five most authoritative domains that are linking to that content one of which is web design from scratch itself because internal links do count the top one is smashingmagazine.com which is domain authority 95 out of 100 so that's very high but this is the thing that I wanted to show you the anchor text tab and here this is showing me again just the top five most popular link text so this is the text that you would see highlighted on a web page and the text that you would click on to follow the link so one of the most important factors that Google uses in order to say well what does the rest of the world say that page is about is the link text so here it's saying that there are 12 different websites that just have the word scratch media pointing to it which is my old company name then this one is am I human how to defend your something or other and I can expand that and see actually where those links are coming from there's one here that says click here to read more then we've got something in Russian and then we've actually got just the URL of the page itself so I do recommend that you use Open Site Explorer to see what link text the rest of the world is using to talk about your pages and we're going to be looking at this tool and others like it a lot more later in the series so these off-page factors when you take them together how many links you've got how many websites they're coming from how authoritative and respectable are those websites and what the links actually say in the clickable text on them when you take all of that together we call that really an inbound link profile and the more of those factors that you've got and the more relevant the link text is then the higher your inbound link profile will be and in terms of open site explorer all of that will build your page authority and page authority really is a, a raw indicator of how strong your link profile is which is a very very relevant factor in how easy it's going to be to get that page to rank so what are we actually setting out to do here well the bottom line is we want to get the maximum relevant traffic in return for the effort that we expend so we start with keyword research which identifies likely candidate target phrases the phrases that people actually type into Google and other search engines then we also need to do competitive analysis so we need to look at those target phrases we need to look at how much competition there is for those phrases so we can filter those down into phrases that we might actually target versus ones that it would not be worth our while to target and then finally we select terms we target those terms that are relevant and for which we can rank high and also we would add that we're going to get the maximum amount of traffic for but it's really really important to rank high why is it important to rank high well here's why the chart on the left hand side shows data that's come from various research that gives us the average click-through rate this is the click distribution throughout the top 20 search results on Google so what this is saying is on average taken over a very very large sample the number one result in Google for any search term is likely to be around one click out of every three clicks that are clicked the number two term is a little bit less than half of that that one gets about one in six the number three term gets about one in nine and so on and this graph actually shows you 
where all those clicks go. So you can see that the vast majority of clicks, around 95% of all the clicks that are clicked, go to the pages between 1 and 10. Those results, that is page 1 of the search results. 95% of all the clicks go to pages that are on that first page in the search results. After that, page 2 drops down sharply, and after page 2, it's pretty much zero. Okay, so no matter how popular a term is, if you're below page 2, you're not really going to get much at all. You'll get very, very few clicks, if any, if you're below page 2. But obviously, it's much better to be up here. It's much better to be in the top 1, top 2, top 3. Because the number 1 result gets twice as many clicks as the number 2 result. And it is, you might say, that it's fundamentally unfair. But really, this just is the way of the world. Take, for example, the 100 meters race at the Olympics. So here we've got an image of the 100 meters race. The number one competitor there is going to get a gold medal. And then the two next people to cross that line will get the silver and the bronze. And everyone else goes away with nothing. Even though the competition may be really, really close. There may be only a hundredth of a second separating those first three people and then number four and number five might be just a whisker behind them, but it doesn't matter. If you're number one, then you get the gold, and the next person across the line gets the silver. Gold is worth a lot more than silver, and it's the same with the search engines. You might also consider the marathon at the Olympic Games. Now here, there are a lot more people competing, but there's still only three medals. There's still only a gold, a silver, and a bronze that go to the top three people to finish. No matter how close the others are, the spoils, the rewards, go to the people who finish the line first. It's the same kind of thing in Formula One, or in most races, actually, where the points are distributed unevenly in favour of the people who come first, second, third, fourth. It's actually, I think, down to about tenth in Formula One. But the person who finishes first gets a lot more points than the person who finishes second. And if you are outside that top ten, there's no points for you. So our goal has to be to finish in the medals. It has to be to finish in the top 10. There's no point aiming for position number 12 and being happy with that, because you can actually do a lot better by ranking at the top of page 1 for a term that may be less popular than by ranking on page 2 for a more popular term, because of this inbuilt unfairness or unevenness in the distribution of clicks. So what's the goal of keyword research? Well, it's to find the most relevant content for which you can get as much traffic as possible. Obviously, the more searches, the better. The more popular a term is, the more times it gets searched every month, the more traffic may be available. But, as we've just said, you almost certainly need to rank in the top 10. You need to aim to rank in the top 10 for your target phrases if you're going to get the maximum traffic. Now I want to tell you about where traffic actually comes from. So this graph here represents part of another graph which I'll show you in a second. And this graph is based on how many visits I've got to my website over a one-year period okay for people coming from the search engines for different search terms so let me show you in Google Analytics so this is my search traffic over the last 12 months in Google Analytics It's going from April 2011 to the present day as you can see my traffic has gone up this is on a weekly basis gone from a low of about 8,000 visits per week and last week we got 25,000 so that's actually tripled over the year which I'm very very happy about. If I scroll down not provided is an unfortunate uh, new development you get that when somebody visits, visits your site who is logged into Google at the time so they don't actually then pass on the search that they use to get to your site but my most popular term is Web 2.0 Design, and 
nearly 11,300 people typed that into to a search engine, but mainly Google, over the last 12 months, and then clicked a link to get through to my site. And that's recorded by Google Analytics. The next term, best designed websites, gets 9,000 visits. Okay. The next term, Web 2.0, gets 7,434. Now, this is out of over three quarters of a million visits from organic search over the 12 month period. So, what's interesting to me is to ask well, you know, these terms are really popular. Is it these terms that provide most of the visits to my website? So, what I've done is I've exported this, is, this page will, will show me the, the top 500 terms. Okay. So I exported these and then I've imported them into a spreadsheet. And here they are. So what I've done in the next column is I'm doing a, a cumulative calculation. So as we go down, it's adding up all of the traffic that's come to these terms so far. And then I'm figuring out the percentage of the total traffic. Now the total traffic taking out the not provided ones is 687,000. Okay, so this term on its own, Web 2.0 design, that's 1.6% of all the visits to my website from search come from that term. The top two terms together are worth 3%. The top three terms are worth 4%. The top f four terms are worth 5%. So what I'm interested in is I wonder where the 50% mark is. So I'm adding all of these together. And then let's scroll down and f see if we can find where that 50% mark is. Okay, my top 100 terms. Web design from scratch is my 100th most popular term. And we are totaling, my top 100 terms, only totaling 22% at this point. So I carry on scrolling down. The quarter mark comes around the top 150 terms. And I carry on scrolling and scroll down and down and down and down and down. 37, 30, 40. There we go. 45. Okay. Here we've got almost 2,000. My 2,000 most popular terms that bring the most traffic to my website. Okay, Add up all the traffic from all those 2,000 variations and combinations and they are only worth 46% of the traffic. It's likely that I'll need to look at and analyze another 1,000 terms to find that 50% point. Okay, Now when I put these numbers into a graph this is what it looks like. Okay, so here is the where they are in the in the list of most popular. So the number one most popular search term gets about eleven thousand searches, and they go down here. Okay, now it seems like there's an awful lot of traffic there, and in fact there is. But look at what happens to the graph after that. It's flattened out, but it's very very long. And here we're up to a thousand, and it's still getting a certain number of searches. And we go on almost to two thousand there, and there's still searches there. But remember, the whole area of this graph, right, is still less than half of my traffic. So m more than fifty percent of my traffic is still to come on here. It's still to come after this two thousand top two thousand visits, right? This is less than half of the traffic to my website. So this is what we call the long tail. When you've got a website that is reasonably broad and rich, in other words, there's a nice variety of content on there, most of your traffic will come from the long tail. In other words, the majority of your visits will come from complex phrases. Quite often they'll come from phrases that have never been typed into Google before. Some people say that half the searches that are typed into Google are being typed in for the first time ever. Most of your traffic will come from those complex phrases, not those most attractive headline, what we call head terms. If you think the long tail is, is like the tail of the snake, those head terms are the, the big headline terms that seem to get the big numbers, but in reality represent only a, a small fraction of your traffic. Okay. However, if you look at it, most of that traffic will actually contain variations of your head terms. So let me go back into Google Analytics. 
So let's take, for example, Web 2.0 as a term. Right, remember, I've got over 700,000 searches. And I can filter just here for terms that include Web Space 2.0. And although the term Web 2.0 gets just 7,000 searches in that year, we've got the term Web 2.0 design, which gets another 11,000. But look, 51,000, over 51,000 searches contain Web 2.0. So Web 2.0 is one of my most popular terms, just in its own right. It's a head term. But we've got all of these variations that get hundreds of visits each. Web 2.0 design style, style Web 2.0. Web 2.0 gradients, web, best Web 2.0 sites, Web 2.0 guide, and they go on and on and on and on. Hundreds of different variations. And if we did that for a few more terms, we would start to see that actually a lot of that long tail is made up of variations and combinations of my head phrases. Okay, which means that a lot of that traffic is coming from those pages that are ranking really high for those major head terms. So from that we need to understand that where the head goes the tail will follow just like a snake. So what do we do with this knowledge? How can you actually optimize for the long tail? Well on one hand we could say that just creating more and more content could create more chances to match more searches and could bring us more traffic but quality is much more important than quantity and this is absolutely critical so I want to show you another little exercise that I did so here I'm in Google Analytics and over the same 12 month period I've done a different query and this is telling me which are my top landing pages so which are the pages that people use to enter my site the most and the the number one is this post and then I've got CSS blocking in line then 10 best designed websites and then my home page now you can see here that I can scroll all the way down and I've got over 500 different landing pages right now would we expect to find a similar pattern would we expect that my most popular few landing pages would get high numbers you know, 200,000 150,000 visits in a year very high numbers very impressive but they do drop down so by 10 we're down to 40,000 etc now would we expect that pattern then to follow a similar pattern to what we saw in the long tail with search phrases so I did the same thing I exported it to a uh, CSV file and I've imported it again into my spreadsheet let me show you the results so here we've got that data brought in from Google Analytics and there's 200,000 visits for that page and 159 for that I've done exactly the same thing I'm doing a cumulative count and then out of 1.75 million visits this is the percentage distribution but look how different it is my number one page actually got one in nine visits over that year and when we add them up my top six pages get almost 50% of all the visits. My top 18 pages actually get 75% of all the visits and then the tail does thin out. So if I put that into a graph like I did before it's quite a different pattern. Here's my top 18 so this thick end, this, this head of this graph is actually three quarters of all the visits come to just a few pages all right so why am I telling you this well I just want you to be absolutely clear that although all those long tail search phrases seem to bring you all of your traffic and and in fact you know they that's pretty true that doesn't mean that we should just create loads and loads and loads of content because it's my most popular pages that get most of that traffic and most of those long tail phrases contain my most popular terms, the terms that I'm ranking at the top of Google for, for popular searches, okay? So all you really need to remember from this is it's better to invest your time and your effort and your resources in creating one really good page than a hundred rubbish ones.
yes, 100 rubbish ones might get you ranking somewhere in search results for a lot more different phrases, but where are they going to get you ranking? See, I'm ranking near the top or at the top of Google for a lot of combined phrases that include the term Web 2.0 or CSS block. And it's the same few pages that come up again and again and again. So why do those particular pages rank so well? Well, let me show you. I'm going to go back to Open Site Explorer. I'm going to go back to Open Site Explorer. And here we've got one of my more popular pages that we looked at before. Now that's got 70 links from 20 different websites. Let's go to an even more popular page. So here's the Web 2.0 design page. I'm going to copy that and I'm going to put that one into Open Site Explorer. So previously we had 21 different websites, 70 links. Okay, This page was created a few years ago. It has a page authority of 69 out of 100. It's got 354 links from 75 different websites. It's been shared 197 times on Facebook. It's had 74 Facebook likes, 183 tweets, and has been added to Google Plus One 28 times. It's got a variety of link text here, as we can see, a lot of them, including Web 2.0, Web 2.0 design. So this really is so this really is proof that quality content beats manual SEO. Okay, I have done really almost no promotion of this page. I created it a while back. It was seen by the people who visit my site and because they liked it they shared it. Because they liked it they tweeted about it. They created links to it from their own blogs from their own other sites and then the snowball effect kicks in. When people start typing in Web 2.0 my page comes out top so it gets more visits and if the content is good then those visits will in turn generate links and these other social signals that, that we've been looking at. If the content was poor then a very very low proportion. If the content was poor then people wouldn't want to share it. They wouldn't want to link to it. And so there's a negative effect, isn't it called an entropic effect. You you really are pushing uphill because the content isn't going to attract more attention and links and attention and links to itself over time but great content does. So we're, we're going to be talking a lot more about great content as we go. It's always better to invest your time in one good page than a hundred rubbish ones. Now as the final part of this overview I want to talk to you a bit about web content strategy. This is a picture that I'd like you to hold in your mind and I think it's a really useful model to help you picture a website. So a website is like a tree. The core part of your site is the trunk of the tree. This is your conversion path as I call it. It's the content on your website that really convinces people in what you do, in why you're good, why you can be trusted and gets them to convert. Whether that's to buy or to subscribe or to request a demo or to contact you through your contact form. And this really is the the first part of your site that needs to exist. Every site needs its home page, its about us page, its contact page. Now growing up from there we've got propositions. And you could understand propositions as being similar to your products that you sell or the services that you provide. So you might have a page for each of those. But propositions can be understood slightly differently as well because for example I've got a pro web design course that I sell and that is one product. But I can package that product in different ways to solve different problems for different people. 
So I sell it through its own main sales page as this is the package that will help you to become a professional web designer if you want to set up on your own in web design. But I also market it as how to earn your way through college for students. Same product but two different propositions because it's packaged differently. So the top part of the tree, the canopy of the tree, is landing pages. And this is quite distinct really from the propositions and the, the trunk of the tree, the conversion path. Landing pages are pages that are designed to rank well on search engines for specific issues that people are searching for and then to feed that traffic through to the propositions okay, and then through to conversion. So the trunk of the tree is your conversion path, that's your core of your website, the stuff that has to be there on day one. Then you've got your propositions, you may have one, you may have many, and they are the branches of the tree, the major boughs of the tree. And then you've got landing pages. And you know the landing pages are there, like, like the canopy of the, the tree collects as much sunlight as possible, the landing pages are there to collect as many visits as possible from search engines and they should all have links pointing to them because they should all be useful. But what's really important here is the way that the landing pages pass the traffic, feed the traffic through to the proposition pages. So the final thing that we're going to do in this introduction is I'm going to just talk you through the model that I use for understanding that and for planning for that. And this is something I call the awareness ladder. I developed it as I was writing my book on conversion optimization, which is called Convert. You can get it on Amazon. And the awareness ladder is a way of segmenting the people who may come to your website in terms of their level of awareness about what you offer. And depending on their level of awareness about what you offer, you need to be showing them different things. There's no point showing somebody a buy this now, it's the best thing ever, if they are not convinced that that's the best thing ever, or if they don't really understand what all the other options are, and don't understand why yours is better, or don't really realize why your thing can solve their problem at all. So I've developed these this six-step sequence, and it starts with step zero. And these are people who are not aware that they've got a problem at all and it's very difficult to market to those people. Following on from that is step one when people become aware that they do have a problem. Okay, So I've just realized that I have a problem or we might also talk about opportunity but I'm not aware of any solutions to that problem. You know, I've found a rash. I don't know what's causing it and I don't know what, what I can do about it. Okay, That's just a step one situation. Then you may become aware of solutions, options that are out there. And that puts you at step two. But somebody at step two is not yet aware of your solution, of your offering. Then somebody can become aware of your offering, but they're not yet convinced that that offering is right for them. Then they become aware of its benefits and finally they become convinced and ready to commit. Now everybody has to go through all of these steps in order to be ready to commit in response to some proposition or offering that you give to them. At some point before they've become aware that there's a problem, they're at step zero. Then they become aware of a problem. Then they think, well, how can I solve it? Then they come up with options. Then they become aware of your offering and they realize why it's particularly good for them, why it's right for them, and then finally they become convinced and they want to put their hand in their pocket or they want to take some kind of action, which means that they are accepting the proposition, accepting the offering, and you've got a conversion there. Everyone has to go through all of these steps. You can't skip steps, okay? And once you understand this, it makes it a lot easier to plan your content on your website. Let me show you how. Okay, we'll just talk through the steps. Okay, step zero: no conscious problem, need, or opportunity. So they're not looking for anything. Okay, so that means you can't target them with SEO. If I haven't got something that I want, or something that I need, or something that I want to resolve, I'm not going to be typing anything into the search engine, right? 
So you can't target these guys with SEO. But what you need to understand about step zero is that actually it could be the biggest chunk of your market could actually be at step zero, depending on what the problem is that you, that you solve with your proposition. So if you can't target them with SEO, the only thing that you can do is to put your message where these people will see it. You have to go to them. So for example, you might put banner ads on another site, or you might write a blog post to go on another site, or a magazine article. Or you might drop leaflets through people's doors saying, have you had your drains cleaned? Advertising quite often works at this level. So you've got ads for motorists to say, you know, come in for a free winter check. Are your tyres going to be safe this winter? If somebody's driving happily along the road at step zero, not aware of a problem. Then they see a sign that says, you know, are your tyres going to be safe when it snows? Come in for a free check. Okay. Suddenly, they go through from step zero to step one. I do have a problem. And then they are presented with a solution. And there's a call to action to say, come in and get it sorted out. But online, and, when we're, and particularly when we're thinking about search engines, you can't market to people at step zero through the search engines. Then once you become aware that there is a problem or an opportunity, you move to step one. And now you can identify people by their searches. Okay, So somebody who's at step one might be typing in something like, how can I? Or they might just describe their problem. Difficulty sleeping is a step one thing. They're not saying, you know, is valerian root an effective solution for sleep problems, okay? Because that means they're already aware of solutions. These are people at step one. They're just talking about their problem. It may also be an opportunity. So it might be, how can I earn money from home? Or ways to do this, okay? Or step one kind of language. So what you do for people at this level is that you create what we call step one content. You create a page called difficulty sleeping or a page called earn money from home or a page called how can I dot 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 whatever the problem is okay that people have. You create content dedicated to that okay and then once people land on that content what you do is you meet them where they are you show you understand the problem or the opportunity and then you go on to step two okay where you start to talk about the options that are available so let's look at step two people at step two are aware that there are solutions or options but they don't know which one's right for them and how can you identify these people well again by their search phrases what is the best way to what is an alternative to some product or some method? Does something or other work for something? There's loads of different ways that people can actually reveal that they are at step two. They've got a problem. They are aware that there are different ways they might address the problem or solve it. But they haven't yet decided which is the right one for them. So what you do at step two is you create step two content. You help them in their research. So you might say, you know, here is a review of different solutions for something or other. Here is a comparison of cheap web hosts. Basically kind of buyer's guides, user guides, that kind of general area. And then at the end of step two, you can see the pattern that's starting to emerge, right? The end of step two you then move them on to step three and you do that by presenting your solution. Step three is where people become aware of your offering. Okay, Remember an offering is not necessarily the same as a product or a service. The same product or service could be used to solve different problems or different issues. I have a consulting service and I have one day rate for consulting. It's basically one service that I offer. But that service could apply to a huge range of different problems that people may have with their online marketing or a huge range of different opportunities that they want to capitalize on. So there's nothing to stop me from presenting that consulting package in multiple different contexts. Okay. Now at step three, people will generally already be on your site. Okay. They'll be on your offering pages. 
It might be your home page, your home page that summarizes who you are and what you do. Or it might be the page for a specific product or service or offering. So generally step three and onwards, people will be on your website. So what you need to do, they're at step three now, they're aware of your offering, you don't need to keep telling them anything. And it may be inappropriate or premature to try and get them to commit or convert at this point because we've got step four next. And step four is to become aware and convinced of the benefits to them of whatever it is that you're offering. So we move on to step four and step five. This is basically the content that helps people to become convinced that what you're offering is the right thing for them at this time and then to compel them to take action. So as we said, this content will nearly always be on your own site, but it may be on the website of affiliates or partners as well. And generally, we can bundle a lot of stuff into step four, such as you know, the benefits, the features. You might have proof and evidence, which might be um, tests, case studies, reviews, and also social proof, things like testimonials, what people say about your product and FAQs and all of this stuff can help build visitors confidence on one side and resolve their doubts. So if you think about anything that you want somebody to do is always something that you can picture as a trade. A trade is where you have two parties that come together and they exchange something with each other. And what is really important to appreciate about a trade is that the thing that each party is getting from the other is worth more to them than what they are giving up. When you go to a car showroom and you buy a car, you hand over some money and you receive a car. And the car is worth more to you than the money that you're giving over. Otherwise, you'd keep the money. But to the car salesman, he wants the money more than the car. The money is worth more to him than the car is. Okay, And you can only have a trade where that is true, where each party sees what they're going to get as worth more to them than what they are giving up. And that can only happen when the confidence on one side of the, the weighing scales outweighs any fear or doubts or concerns on the other side. Yeah? And what, you're, what you think you're going to get is worth more than what you're giving up or what you're risking. So the purpose of step four content really is to emphasize what you're going to get and why you can be confident in this and why you can trust us and why you know your transaction is safe and why you know we're going to respect your contact details, for example. And when you can build up that confidence and that conviction that what they're going to get is worth more than the cost or the risk of what they're handing over, then you're going to get a conversion, then you're going to get a trade. And the trade may be somebody putting in their credit card details to buy something, or it may be something as simple as putting in your name and email address to sign up to a mailing list. Because every time you do that, there may be something in the back of your mind going, am I going to get spammed from this? You know, Are they going to pass on my details? Am I really going to be interested? Have I got time to read the emails? All those kinds of things. So there's always going to be something on that side of the scales. The cost, the risk, the doubt. So whatever trade it is that you are proposing in your offering, the job of the step four content is to convince people that the trade is worth it. And then step five is literally finishing off with a nice strong call to action to get somebody to take action now. Do it today. So here's our web content strategy tree again, and it's again divided into those three parts, but now we've added the steps of the awareness ladder. Okay, Step zero isn't on here because your website can't actually target anyone at step zero. But you may have ads on other people's sites that might do that, or blog posts. So we've got your landing pages at the top, your canopy, your canopy that grows, okay? This is all step one and two. Your step one content should lead people into step two content, which should lead people into your propositions, your step three content, your homepage, your product or service pages, the things that you're actually proposing. And then from step three, the next natural step is for people then to move on to your conversion path, your convincing and compelling content that will get them to take action. 
So what we understand from this is here's the web content process. This is how it looks. You've got to make sure your trunk is in place. You're converting content. Okay, you're convincing content. And as you build landing pages, you've got to make sure that every page that you create has a logical next step. You want to lead people forward. You don't want them to move sideways or move back. You want to take them onto that next step on the awareness ladder. You want to build their awareness towards your solutions. So that's my introduction to the whole SEO process. So let's just recap. The purpose of SEO is to get onto page one for the best terms you can. And those best terms are going to be the ones that are popular and that are relevant to your content. You've got to be on page one if you can, or at least work towards being on page one, because that's where you'll get the most clicks, because there's an unfair distribution. And you can create as many landing pages as you like to target those multiple phrases. Now, while we understand that most of your traffic will actually come through complex original combinations of search terms, the vast majority of visits will go to the best pages, the best linked pages, the most respected pages on the web. So that's why we say we've got to write great content. We've got to make the content really, really good, really useful, and then we've got to promote it. But the next step is keyword research, and that's what we're going to look at in the next video.